Oh, wow. Well, we've seen a whole bunch of great talks from some very inspiring people. And, uh, and they've helped us to rethink the way we act, the way we feel, and even the way we live life. But what does living life mean to you? What do you love about it? Is it the way you spend time with your family and friends? Is it playing or even cheering for your favourite sports? Is it travelling and broadening your horizons? I honestly think that there's a whole combination of all of these things, including the fact that you're able to express yourself through creating things through art or music or movement. Now, what about those who it's not so easy for? What happens when severe disability gets in the way? Is technology the answer to bridge the gap between now and when science finds cures for the vast ranges of disability out there? Can the power of the mind be adequately harnessed to safely control assistive technology? I'm going to share with you a story that has inspired me through my years of research, some technology that I've been working on in an effort towards enabling those in need, and even share with you a story that um, an example of someone who is amazing and enabling technology has allowed her to show her passions in life. So what brought me to working on enabling technologies? I'll start a little bit with my background. I come from a good home and a loving family. And, uh, <laughs> and it can be lonely being an only child. So my parents, I think they realised this and decided to have a second baby. But baby number two turned into baby number two, three and four because they had triplets. <laughs> And I now had my own little tennis team. <laughs> We've been a tennis team and very close our whole lives, and, uh, and we still are today. Now, being able to share this passion of tennis has been fantastic for us, but I almost had this passion taken away from me one day at a backyard pool party. It was a, um, it was a friend's birthday. It was a sunny day. It was a, a family friend, and it was her birthday. We were diving off this diving board. Not this one. It was much dodgier than this. Into a, into a pool all afternoon, and I happened to be the lucky person that was on it when the board came loose. Now, this board came loose and moved back as I dived off it, going into the water, coming back towards the wall, not knowing which direction I was headed in until my head hit the bottom of the pool and snapped to the side. Now, the crunch that I felt and heard in the back of my neck was absolutely deafening, and immediately I was convinced I'm never going to play tennis again. So I came to the top of the water, quickly moved my arms around, moved my legs, that was okay. My head was kind of bobbing on the water. Uh, so I got out of the pool holding my head and I went up to mum and said, mum, I think I've broken my neck. And mum went, what? What happened? And I started to explain and I let go of my head and it went... <laughs> so of course I got rushed off to hospital and uh, this was the x-ray that came out of it. No fractures, no breakages, so it's all good. I heard some people go, oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> and I was sent home. But by the time I got put in bed, I got the shock of pain all the way from the top of my neck all the way down my back and it was from the damaged muscles and I got stuck on my back for one entire whole day, not able to move, not able to roll over, and I started thinking, is this going to be a permanent thing? Now, when I was able to get up and walk the next day, I realised how lucky I got. And it made me think, what would be out there if, um, if this was a permanent thing? What technologies are out there to do something like, say, control a wheelchair? I just didn't know, so I started looking it up. Now, I found that you're able to control a wheelchair with hands-free controls for disability from the neck down uh, by either moving your chin or pushing against head pads or even a tube to be able to control a wheelchair. Very difficult to use, really difficult to use. I've seen children, even after months of using this system, still crashing it into things in rehabilitation centres. Now, this is difficult to control. So this, uh, this provides two questions for us. How do we make this safer? And also, what happens if you can't use any of these systems? Now, I realised if, if you are not able to use any of these um, hands-free control systems, then there's nothing available to you. And this brought me to my next um, story, which I was able to, to find on TV. It was on ABC TV. Uh, Marie Burke Callis, it was her story, and it was called Locked in Your Own Body, or Trapped in Your Own Body. This is uh, Marie with her daughter, and... She was a very active person in her community. She was a netball player and a, um, a school teacher. Now, in Marie's eyes, this is what happened on a regular day. She got up and she had breakfast. She went and had a shower. And then when she was walking back to her room, everything went black. 
Now, Marie wo woke up in the hospital, and she can see and hear everything going on around her. She see the doctors, the family, and she tried to speak to them, and she couldn't. And she tried to move, and she couldn't do that either. Now, what happened was Marie had a huge stroke that left her with locked-in syndrome, and this means that now she can only move her eyes. She's no, no longer able to move or speak. Now, when the doctors realised this, they asked her one absolutely chilling question. It gives me goosebumps. They said, Marie, do you want to live? Blink once for yes or twice for no. Now, Marie said that she put everything, every ounce of her being into that single blink because, of course, she wants to live on. Now her life is a bit different. Her husband is fantastic and he does the communication for her and so do, so do some other people around her. She can control her eye movements and so they watch for those movements and they piece together letters that turn into words, that turn into sentences. But she has a great will and great motivation to move ahead <laughs> with her life and you can see that she's still got a great sense of humour. She's completely sharp up top and that's just so inspiring to see someone push through these challenges now, that made me want to design something for, for people in this situation. I thought, I want to be able to move into designing something new, some new technology that might be able to help someone in this situation. But you need to be able to talk to the people who you're designing for. Otherwise, you find yourself, like me, potentially trying to imagine a solution to a problem you can't even imagine. So you need to be able to talk to the people that you're designing for. And you also need to be able to remind yourself of why you're doing what you're doing. And that helped me get through my uh, entire, entire thesis. So for my undergraduate thesis and my PhD thesis, I designed a smart wheelchair. So a smart wheelchair can basically see and think for itself. And, uh, and that can help make travel safe. So this is the smart wheelchair I designed. I used uh, camera systems for the wheelchair to be able to see for itself. There's two different camera systems in here. And I modeled it, modeled it on the, uh, the vision system of a horse. Like, Horses are crazy. They've got a really great vision system. So humans, when we look forward, we can see 180 degrees. If you put your arms out, don't do it now. <laughs> if you put your arms out and you look ahead, you can see 180 degrees. Horses can see 335 degrees. So when they're looking forward, they can see everything except their own butt. <laughs> it's a very effective vision system because they spend a lot of time grazing, as horses do and they've got their eyes lowered, they can see in three dimensions in front of them because they've got a binocular overlap where the eyes overlap, the vision, and everything else they can see once. And so they use this to detect when uh, predators are coming along. So I thought, this is a great vision system. I'm going to put this into the wheelchair. And so this is how I designed it. I used stereoscopic vision at the front, which is two cameras, both operating the same way as our own eyes do. We can see in three dimensions because uh, we've got two slightly different perspectives on the world. It's uh, not a redundant system in case you lose an eye. It's uh, so we can see in three dimensions. And this is what I use. So two cameras, they can see the scene in front of the wheelchair. We put these together. Objects that are closer to the cameras will appear in different locations horizontally. But things in the distance will appear in the same location. Now that distance, that discrepancy between the two images can be used to determine exactly how far away the object is. So applying this principle to the, uh, the images that are coming in many times a second from the wheelchair, we can project that into the third dimension. Having three-dimensional space means we can rotate it. So the wheelchair actually kind of sees everything from above as it's moving through its environment, kind of like it's playing its own video game as it's trying to find its way around objects. Now, I also wanted to be able to, to have it work in dynamic environments with people moving around, so I decided to also give it spherical vision. So it's basically like the horse being able to see everything around it except getting rid of that blind spot, and this allows a wheelchair to be able to see everything around it. Now, you guys have all seen panoramas where people go click, click, click and put them together. Check this out. It's a video panorama. The wheelchair can see everything in front of it, all the way to the side. It can see the roof, it, just because you can and it can see everything around it. So the edges of the screen here are everything behind the wheelchair. So it's a very effective vision system because now it can see everything around it as it travels. And it can detect the people as it's moving so it doesn't knock into anyone. And that way, the wheelchair can get from A to B, traveling through any sort of environment, avoiding crowds, avoiding objects, and making the travel safe. Now the idea there is making the travel safe allows hands-free controls, any of the ones on the market, to become safe, but it also allows us to target new um, people who haven't been reached before. So we can design new technologies, including thought control. 
being able to control something with your mind is not exactly easy. It's not exactly easy to be able to constantly focus, but when the travel is safe, it doesn't matter what you tell it to do, it won't crash. So this is what I've designed. This is Albert. He's uh, controlling the wheelchair using the headband that you see placed over his head. Now this houses some electrodes which picks up on the electrical activity of the brain, otherwise known as electroencephalography or EEGs. Now those brain waves are coming out, it's completely non-invasive. Um, they're being picked up on and sent into the wheelchair. So the wheelchair can basically figure out which directions he's trying to travel in. When he sends a new command to it, the wheelchair then takes over and makes sure that it's safe. And this is called shared control because both the operator and the wheelchair are sharing control over the operation and over the, the manoeuvring and getting to the targets. So Albert can give it sort of overall um, directional commands. Now he has actually just told the wheelchair to go through the signpost there. And the wheelchair says, okay, I'll do that, but I'll go around the, the signpost and make this travel safe. In this way, they learn to, to deal with each other. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all really good. It seems like you know, being able to utilize any sort of control technology out on the market and have a smart wheelchair that allows it to make the travel safe, that seems like a very sort of innovative concept. But this is the interesting thing. Smart wheelchair technology has actually been around for about 30 years. So it's been around longer than I've been alive. Now, I've found upwards of 150 different smart wheelchair designs in literature. So what's the barrier that's stopping this important technology getting out there to the people who need it? Now this is where, it's, a, it's actually a pretty simple concept. Different research groups, organisations, including universities around the world, do what I did. We see the need, we design our own smart wheelchair design, which is very expensive. Then we look at all the other research being done out there and say, okay, here's the gap. For me, I'm saying cameras have not been used that much. Uh, I'm using a wheelchair that's got cameras and it can navigate in unknown indoor environments. So it's unknown to the wheelchair as it's moving through it. And it can even move through dynamic environments. But then we've got wheelchairs that might know the environment already, that have maps of the place. Now this is a completely different set of algorithms. If you take the wheelchair outside, you've got a whole bunch of algorithms that are completely different all, all over again. So this is where my new vision came in. This is my vision. I've put together a team to help design the next smart wheelchair prototype, which is a, uh, a retrofit system, meaning that we can take this, um, this system and place it onto a, smart, onto a power wheelchair and turn that power wheelchair into a smart wheelchair. We fit it with all the different sensors that are required for any sort of situation, and that way, all the different research groups would be able to collaborate. And collaboration is going to be key here, because everyone has their own different bits of knowledge. So we all hold different pieces of a very powerful puzzle that if brought together, and we put, together the, uh, put in the different missing pieces of this puzzle, we'll be able to improve the quality of life for many people out there. So that's why I'm going into designing this. And the idea of having a tablet PC as the brain of the wheelchair allows much more than just mobility. We can pack mobility, communication, education and entertainment all into one system because the person can not only, fi not only uh, find their way around, but they can communicate through the system, they can control the lights and the TV in their homes and also be able to surf the net. So there's an obvious need for more enabling technologies, but I'm going to leave you with a story that has inspired me. So this is my good friend Jess Irwin. She's actually here today. And I met Jess um, after, a, after presenting at a, a youth disability conference. I got off stage, Jess and her friend came over to me and her friend started asking me a few questions. And I started answering. But actually while I was answering those questions, I was trying to actually figure out, given my own ignorance and, and uh, inexperience at the time, I was actually trying to figure out if Jess could understand me because Jess has high level cerebral palsy and is non-verbal, but that doesn't stop her, she is amazing. And <laughs> she's got so many of her own mannerisms that, that come out really quickly, so I started to realize this, and also she's got a very infectious laugh. Now, Jess, after a little while, opened up her touchscreen tablet and started tapping on it, and I realized she asked me a question on it, and I thought, great, brilliant, she can understand me just fine. Sat down with her and we communicated. Now, after a little while, just tap, tap the words, this is what I do. She passed over a business card. Jess is a photographer, a graphics designer, and a website designer running her own business. 
and her work is absolutely amazing. So Jess is living proof of what enabling technologies can do for someone in these situations to help her express her passions and live life her own way. So if you've taken anything from this, just please appreciate what you have. Appreciate your ability to express yourself and to live life your own way. But also empathise and advocate for those who it's not so simple to. So whether you feel like showing your support for those who are out there working hard to make a difference, or even if you're working towards it yourself, let's help each other to be able to enable people to live life their own way, just like Marie. Thank you.